make sure you're not saying stuff like that but we oh, can i may have to get a whiskey <laughs> <laughs> I can't, like, it's it's a, you smell it once and you're like yeah. oh, okay <laughs> While this podcast will always be free, the time and effort that goes into the production isn't. Show your support and join our Patreon community today. Hey everybody, welcome back to this week's episode of Burn Pursuit. Kenny here, and we're going to run through just a little bit of the news of what has been happening this past week. And we're not going to hit on everything because there was uh, a lot of controversy that happened on Facebook about a distillery out in Georgetown, some waxes, some things that were... Um, I guess you could say banned on some certain markets, but we're going to kind of stay away from that just for a little bit. But one of the other big things is that there is a, a lot of new provisions that could possibly coming through the TTB. Now, SKU, I'm sure if you've been around the block for a while, you know who he is, but he did a fantastic job of wrapping this up on the KNL Wine blog. It talks about a lot of the potential changes including some of the things that we're gonna talk about here. First is that the state of distillation must be on every single label. It's gonna start classifying what is a grain. Uh, you know, we talk about quinoa, we talk about wheat, but what is an actual classification of grain? Speaking of classifications, what about saying, what about bourbon and whiskey that's finished in other barrels? Angel's Envy and all these other ones that say uh, it's a straight bourbon and whiskey finished in X, Y, or Z. Well, this is gonna actually look at giving an actual classification to it. And not only that, as we're looking at changing the laws, you know, if you're, if you, you know, the TTB, you know, the rules, you're a bourbon, bourbon pursuit listener that to be called a bourbon whiskey, it has to be in a new charred oak container. Well, this is actually going to change it to say a new charred oak barrel. So no longer a container, but an actual barrel. And it's going to even go as far as that. This even say that whiskey aged in new charred oak barrels, if those barrels are less than 50 gallons, it can't be called bourbon. There's a lot of cool things in there that, who knows, could change the face of what bourbon is tomorrow. It's a great read. Make sure you go and check it out. You can get it in our show notes. Now, if you're also a Patreon supporter, our new Rift Barrels have shipped out. We're done. We're sold out. They're across the country. And so thank you so much. We've got this one underneath our belts. We've got a lot more to come. But this is also a public service announcement, not only for our private barrels that we're getting through Keg and Bottle, or sorry, private barrels we're getting through Keg and Bottle, but as well as Pursuit Series, our private label, that you need to sign up on the forms on Patreon. We ship these out every single time. I'll make an announcement. I'll put it out there. You should get an email blast. If you're not getting the emails through Patreon, I've sent almost like three of them this past week. If you're not getting those emails, you need to go check your spam folder because that's where all the sign up forms to get your hands on all of our bottles are. So please make sure you're going doing that if you are a member of our Patreon community. Now, today's episode is going to be a fun one. We haven't had Jen Rutledge on for a long time. In fact, the last time he was on were episodes 11 and 12. This is 178, so you do the math. But back then, it was a double header. That's when we were doing 30-minute episodes. And I remember being there with Ryan, and we asked maybe three questions in total. And we let Jim just run with it. He can just talk and talk and talk, but he's full of great information. I remember sitting there looking at Ryan and looking at my watch and saying, should we cut this off? And actually, we didn't do that. We're actually texting at the table. And I said, should we cut this off? And he's like, no, this is, this is gold. We gotta, gotta let it keep it going. And this time we're here and Jim is in my basement recording. And this time we're talking about Four Roses, his time there. And you can also hear Fred try to pry some of that information out of him while his time there too. But Jim took a walk around my bar and he told me about how the 125th anniversary was one of his favorite bottlings of all times. And I took that opportunity and I said, you know what, let's crack this open and let's share a drink together along with him and Fred. So it was a great memory and very happy to do that. And it couldn't have been better timing for all this because Jim Rutledge He's back. He's finally back on the map because this week is his TTB label approving for a new brand that he's actually reviving. And if you're a dusty person, you might have heard this brand called Cream of Kentucky. Yes, it was finally approved by the TTB. We talk about this bourbon and where it's headed in this exclusive episode. So if you want to see the, T the label and the TTB filing, make sure you check out the show notes as well. Now, if you're curious what we're drinking on every week, 
make sure you follow us on Instagram at Bourbon Pursuit. And you should probably just go ahead and follow at Pursuit Spirits as well if you want to get all the latest information on all the new releases since we are doing two barrels a month. Now, with that, enjoy this week's episode. Here's a message from Joe at Barrel Bourbon, and then you're going to hear Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hi, this is Joe from Barrel Craft Spirits. Coming this fall to our Barrel Craft Spirits line is a 25-year-old American whiskey finished in Circeo Madeira casks. Use our store locator to find a retailer or bar near you at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Let me tell you about a friend. I won't give his real name. Let's say his name is John. John's a guy who got into bourbon, fell in love with it, joined all the Facebook groups, started buying all the bourbons he could possibly get. John loved bourbon. And then one day, he started getting into arguments on social media. And he started to get sour toward bourbon. And the taste of bourbon wasn't quite the same. You see, that's what's happening to a lot of us out there. We get into these social media groups and we just start arguing with one another about what's better. Um, We start ripping people who are new. We start just getting into arguments that don't even matter. And I wonder, is that hurting bourbon? And then I recall five to six years ago when I was writing my book, Bourbon Curious. I'm now updating that book for a second edition, so this is kind of top of mind. But at that time, there was nobody really championing transparency. Well, there were a couple brands, like Four Roses was always very transparent. But most distillers were not even disclosing their mash bills or giving you a lot of information about their whiskey. They would sell you some marketing uh, ploy that they would have connected to their brand, but there was not a deep-rooted effort of transparency. That has changed in a lot of ways in the last five to six years. And while I know that the traditional writers like myself and Chuck Cowdery have definitely had a hand in that, I believe it's been the individuals on Facebook and Reddit demanding transparency. People wanting to know where their whiskey came from, what grains they came from, what the mash bills are. And so the next time you find yourself getting down and disgusted with what's going on in the social media groups regarding bourbon, just remember, it was these groups that really drove transparency to what we have today. So don't sweat all this negativity you're seeing. And just remind yourself, without social media, we probably wouldn't know where a lot of these whiskeys came from. And that's this week's Above the Char. If you have an idea for Above the Char, please hit me up on Twitter or Instagram at Fred Minnick. Again, that's at Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Mm-hmm. Kenny and Fred recording in our basement studio once again, but this time we have a legend in lore back on the show. This is somebody that we were very excited when we first actually began this podcast to be able to interview because we had this guest on for both episodes 11 and 12. And I remember this vividly. We were, we were sitting in, in Jim's office at four roses and that was also back at the time when we were recording 30 minute episodes because we thought like, Oh, that's what people want 30 minutes. And I think out of, uh, the whole time we were there, we might have asked like four or five questions, and and Jim was just so uh, you can see the passion in some of the stuff, the stuff that he talks about. And we looked at each other, me and Ryan at the time, and we were like, "We're just going to keep recording, like let's not stop." And so yeah. that's when we released back to back episodes of of Mr. Rutledge here, and it, it's just fun to to be able to pick this guy's brain that's been around the industry forever and is also you know helping everybody else in the industry even after his retirement. Well, I'll say this: Jim's been very influential in my career. Uh, because he's somebody um, I, re- I respect, and I will just ask him anything, you know, and uh, and that's really actually to the point of life. Like, I consider him a friend. He's a great guy. But more importantly, I don't know if there's been uh, a cont- contemporary distiller who's more knowledgeable about 
distilling for you know from from fermentation to the maturation and i remember when he retired it was um i had a personal i felt a personal void uh for my career because i would just email jim and it's like hey what is the importance of ph on sour mash and i would get a, a four-page dissertation in an email and uh I treasured that, and I was afraid I was going to lose that. And we didn't. Come to find out, he had something else up his sleeve. Come to find out, he couldn't. He couldn't stay retired for very no. long. No. In fact, someone tried to hire him within, uh, you know, twenty minutes of him retiring. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's good to know that you're you're still valued and you're still wanted around. That's right. Me. That's that's awesome. So let's go ahead and introduce our guest today. So today we have Jim Rutledge, who's been on the show before, but he is also the <coughs> former master distiller from Four Roses. He is now a consultant amongst many distilleries that you see. So. So, Jim, welcome back. Thank you, and it's good to be back with you and uh, look forward to this. I hope uh, (laughs) some of the questions uh, you said you asked, uh, I had a friend of mine, uh, it goes back to my years in college at University of Louisville and fraternity, and it was in our pledge class together. We have monthly luncheons. and uh, Did you haze him? (laughs) <laughs> no, he, we we were together <laughs> doing that, oh. <laughs> being hazed. What's a pledge class? Perhaps, but uh, uh, one of the last luncheons I attended, he says, Jim, you know, a friend of mine told me, and, and I use it all the time now, he said, at our, our age, uh, our re, uh, retention, uh, <laughs> recall, uh, has a range of about 15 seconds to 15 hours. So <laughs> we'll see how this goes. I'm sure it'll go just fine. Now, one of the things that we do want to kind of just talk about is, um, you know, let's rewind back a little bit because you had retired from Four Roses at 2015? Uh, was 2015. That? So what was... Wow. You took, a, I don't know, what was it, a month and a half break, something like that, then you announced you were going to try to do something different. What, what was... Ron, us back to that time. What were you yeah, I'm not sure it was that long. Um I know it took me about a week, I guess, to realize that a uh, retirement week consisting of uh, one Sunday and six Saturdays wasn't going to be my cup of tea. And I actually had uh, two calls. Uh, the day I retired, it was announced, uh, my retirement was announced at noon on July 1st, 2015, that I was retiring effective September 1st. And I had uh, a call from a distillery out of state, a uh, new distillery plans that just hadn't been built it was just in the planning stages right then and uh asked me if i would consider being a master distiller i said i need more than a day of retirement before i take on uh working for somebody else Mm -hmm. and uh i started a consulting job a little over a year ago about well about a year and a half ago i guess uh february 2017 i was contacted with by one of the investors of castle and key I uh, was starting his own brand. He had made his uh, fortune, I guess, in eastern Kentucky during the coal mining years. He was in the insurance side of the business, and I think he sold his business. I'm not sure what. But he invested in Castle and & Key. And, but since uh, he left eastern Kentucky and the coal mining industry just evacuated and deserted the area, and the people there are so uh, – it's sad. Uh, the, the land is uh, – you know, not worthy after all the strip mining, of uh, farming. Uh, uh, all the families there had spent generations working in the coal mining industry, and it, it's it's uh, it's a pretty bad situation, as most of us know. And he's been putting, uh, running charity events in Eastern Kentucky, trying to put money back into the area, reclaim the land, and. Uh, we talked a, a couple of, met a couple of different times about, uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do because we had, myself and uh, a couple other guys that started our endeavor of starting our own distillery. But he told me that uh, uh, his brand, which would be named Reclamation, uh, Reclamation Bourbon, Reclamation Straight Rye, uh, 100% of the profits would be funneled back into restoring, reclaiming the land in eastern Kentucky, which sold me on the project, and hence the name Reclamation Rye and Reclamation Bourbon. And it was at Castle and & Key. And so I've been working there uh, 
uh, off and on uh, since I guess we started uh, officially April last April, not this April a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, April seventeen, and we started working uh, producing bourbon, and, and just a week ago we ended the first rye straight rye run. I'd only run rye one time at uh, Four Roses, and that was back in. 97 or 98 when all the rye for Seagram was produced in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, MGP now. And uh, they were tight on schedule and uh, they needed somebody else to run some. So we ran, it was only, I think, 21 fermenters, uh, about three days of rye. So it had been a long time. It was a, a new experience. And uh, Whatever happened to that rye? Because I don't think I remember any sort of rye release ever happening from Four Roses. No, it was... Uh, Seagram didn't have a straight rye, but uh, Seagram was primarily a blended whiskey company, mm -hmm. whether it be Seagram 7 or Crown Royal, VO, or the many blended whiskeys they had. Uh, they they were always heavy in straight whiskeys. Um, it, a blended whiskey made in the U.S. has to have a minimum of 20% straight whiskeys, and Seagram always had quite a bit more than that, and a lot of them were 100% whiskeys. But uh, they had bourbon, straight rye, uh, uh, barley, whiskey, barley, bourbon, uh, uh, a corn whiskey, a lot of different whiskeys. They were all flavoring components for the blend of whiskeys, and that's how it was used. Gotcha. So, you know, I don't think a lot of people know that you've had a, had a hand in a lot of the stuff that's going on at Castle and Key because we don't see you on Instagram with, with Mary and Eves all the time, uh, you know, smiling, taking pictures. I don't and, know, Jim, are you on Instagram? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm still a dinosaur when it comes to all the social media. No, I'm not. So what else? Do you, what else do you got your hands in with uh, at Castle and Key? Because I think it's a it's a pretty interesting thing to know because a lot of the uh, credit is all probably attributed to Marianne, which I'm sure it, it, a lot of it is. But you've you've, oh, you've been she, doing a lot yeah, of stuff she, there Marianne's too. Marianne's going to be great and uh, really good for the industry. They made a really good choice, I think, in selecting her as a distiller. But uh, she had never really worked in a distillery at Brown Foreman, not much anyway, distilling. And, uh, but she's learning, and she's, she'll spend 12, 15 hours a day if necessary, if that's what it takes. And she spends a lot of time. She's learning a lot. But, you know, you never, ever stop learning. And uh, most of it's learning the equipment, how to operate the, uh, whether it be the still, best temperatures to set a fermenter, uh, Yeasting, uh, how they do it, uh, it's it's quite a bit different than what we did at Four Roses, but because uh, they they don't propagate their own yeast. They're doing dry yeast. They use dry yeast, but they they put it in a, a water solution uh, mm -hmm. and feed it in uh, liquid form. But uh, yeah, she's going to be good, really good. Uh, but it takes a while; it takes a long time, and. Honestly, uh, Mary Ann's often uh, working uh, midnight shifts or uh, yeah. afternoons. Mm -hmm. uh, spends a lot of time. I honestly very rarely see her at the distillery. The first first time around I did, because uh, she was showing me around uh, and showed me what they do. We started off running like they were, and then I started making adjustments. And uh, It's a nice place to work, and uh West Murray, Will Arvin, I mean, the owners that started that, their passion. Uh, I talked with them when they were just in the planning stages. They had purchased the property in the distillery. I, I had them out one Saturday at, uh, at Four Roses and spent uh, a half a day, three quarters of a day just going through the process and talking about quality and, you know, for, from the time the grain comes in, don't unload a truck of grain until you've actually approved it, because you never know for sure. You, you know, pretty certain it's going to be good, but you can't. Nothing's guaranteed. And uh, talked about the importance of, uh, uh, you know, so many new distilleries think distillation is. You know, we have master distillers. I guess a better term might be master fermenters or something different, <laughs> but that wouldn't sound too good. But all the flavor is generated from the selection of the grain, the milling of the grains, uh, the ferment, the mashing process, so getting your pHs right. Uh, you, you know, people put a lot of emphasis, come up with this secret super duper mash bill. I said, I don't care what the mash bill is; <laughs> it's what you do with it after you select it. 
and uh, any mash bill can be good, and uh, you you know you have to stay within the requirements of bourbon. And uh, I always, as you probably know, I, I prefer a high rye mash bill. And, uh, but whether it's sweet or uh, low rye, it doesn't make any difference. You've got to be good. The process has to be good to be something good going in the, in the barrel and ultimately in the bottle. So I, I emphasize and focused on that. And, but their passion uh, for the bourbon industry is just out of this world. And uh, just being around them... I, I, I enjoy the atmosphere there, and they've uh, one of the things they've really done well, uh, I think, is hire really passionate, really good employees, and that's critical. That's key because they're the one that's there every day and uh, uh, doing all the work. And uh, but uh, I've enjoyed working with them, and uh, uh, left uh, like I said about a week ago. We ended. And I ran into Wes in a parking lot uh, a few days as we were winding down just prior to that. And Wes asked me, he he was talking about how the employees, because I love to teach and love to pass on. Uh, Don't hold anything back. Don't hold any secrets at all. And uh, every move, every change we would make to the process they use for other customers or themselves, I always explain this is what we hope to achieve, and if, if this doesn't work, we'll try something else. Uh, Did you see a, like a different level of passion at Castle and Key than what it was at Four Roses when you were sort of leaving at that time? Like something that's like renewal of energy instead of something that's been kind of like a, a consistent, good churning, well, well oiled engine, if you will. I always thought uh, I was prejudiced, obviously, but I always thought. We had we being four roses uh, going back in the Seagram years and and into uh, after business with uh, Karen after Seagram went out of business, but I thought we had the best employees in the world uh, in the industry anyway, and uh, they were always very passionate. They understood the job. They knew uh, the job, and I mean they tested me when I got there. I, uh, when I got to Four Roses. Uh, They'd gone through some bad years. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, back in 88, they needed more quantity than they could produce. They took shortcuts and changed a lot of the process. The quality went downhill, and then they couldn't get it back. And when I got to Four Roses, I said, we, if we can't produce uh, a gallon that is really good quality, we don't need to produce it, anything. And uh, they said, yeah, at first, yeah, we've heard that before. Everybody says it. Nobody does it. And, but working together, I, I was probably spending uh, a minimum of 16 hours a day. I did that because when I got there, I'd been told by uh, uh, headquarters in New York that uh, I started in November 94. And then because the quality had been uh, so bad for several years, that when we had our regular summer maintenance shutdown, starting about mid-June 95, that if we didn't turn the quality around, uh, the work could start the distillery back up. They already had a contract written with another distillery. All four rows of straight bourbon was uh, being sold to international markets, Europe and Japan, and what wasn't sold there was used in blended whiskeys, like we were in Crown Royal, uh, Sigrum VO, Sigrum 7. What kind of corners were being cut? Because you, you, you talked about you know the quality being down, but what, well, what was they, really contributing to that? Well, they reduced, uh, like, the beer. you know what a beer gallon is? That's, uh, that's a ratio of uh, the grains in mashing uh, and fermentation to the total liquid. And uh, you get your best quality at a higher beer gallon rate. And just to get more gallons out, this is just one example. They cut it down to, I think, 28 beer gallons. And, but uh, they took shortcuts on uh, the propagation of the yeast, uh, using some economic, uh, the reusing water again in the process that had been previously used, which doesn't work. And uh, so things like that. So I just went back to basics when I got there. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I knew from years before, because I'd, I'd spent 15 years in New York, and uh, I, if, 
between my time in the distillery in Louisville, where I started, when I got transferred up to New York, been spent 15 years up there, and every year I would, uh, during annual reviews, I'd always ask the guy I was reporting to, uh, or uh, the guy I was reporting, reporting to his boss, uh, uh, every year, so if there's ever an opportunity for me to get back into dis distillation, distillery operations, I'd certainly be, appreciate being considered for it. And uh, that would go in one ear and out the other, I thought. And uh, never would anywhere. But in 1990, uh, we talked and uh, he said, Jim, you've been asking me every year you've been here about getting back into d distillation. And uh, said, I'm going to retire in the next two or three years. He retired early, about, uh, he was about 57 or 58, I think. And uh, he said, I tell you what, things have worked out so well up here, I'm going to do my best to get you back. And he did. I mean, it was, I got transferred two years later in 92. I got back in Kentucky. The one of me asked me to go straight to the distillery. I said, you know, it's, I've been out of it so long, I need to get back in the swing of things. So I went... Uh, Back as a Kentucky area manager, I was working in the uh, budget and standards department, and I was also doing the long-range distillery planning uh, when I left. So uh, I came back as Kentucky area manager down at the warehouse operation, uh, Cox Creek, and, and running that. And then I was asked in April 94 by a guy that had taken my place when I left uh, New York, and he was ultimately to become the executive vice president of um, manufacturing of North America. And he came down and asked me if I would consider going back up to New York uh, for two months in September or October, prepare, prepare the bu production division budget for him, uh, because he had been reassigned to a, a re-engineering uh, project that Seagram was going through at the Tropicana facility uh, that Seagram owned in Tampa, and no one really had the experience to put together the budget. He said, but then when you come back, you, uh, we'd like to put you in the distillery, and uh, that would be the 1st of November, 94. And he said, you have an option of taking it because we can't guarantee you'll have a job afterwards. And then he explained that uh, mm. that it was going to be shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, at the summer shutdown of 95 if we didn't turn the quality around. So I lived at the distillery, and finally the guys caught on. They they knew I was serious. I got samples, uh, distillate samples. Now, they, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, didn't use the five yeast that we used at Four Roses. They just used V yeast, but they had the same two mash bills. The same V yeast. Mm -hmm. The same, same V yeast, yeast. Yeah. right. So I would get good samples from uh, Indiana, and I would go through shifts. It was after everybody left in the days. You know, I'd spend all the whole day shift there uh, in the office. I'd take two or three trips through the distillery. And after everybody left, uh, all the administrative people, the maintenance uh, personnel, then it was just the operators and myself, I'd spend the next eight hours or so. Uh, I was always there to see the midnight shift come in, uh, and I was there before they left the next morning. And that went on until uh, till we shut down. And, uh, but they finally realized, but it was usually afternoon shifts, 9 or 10 o'clock, that we would uh, have all the operators on that shift. And we have four shifts of operators running a 24-7 operation. One shift always off, and then we had three shifts. You know, explaining, I'd set up a sample glass like we have here with distillates in, with Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and what we were producing. And uh, I showed them the difference, mm -hmm. and they could. It was dramatic difference. I said, if we can't become like this, uh, be different flavor, but good like this, then we don't need to be producing. So anyway, we were getting better, and and I was sending. Uh, I was I actually had Al Young, who was a distillery supervisor. I was having him go up most afternoons with a sample of the dis distillate we produced the night before, or day before meeting a guy from Lawrenceburg, Indiana, uh, quality department, having people look at it other than ourselves. And uh, uh, there's two guys up there, uh, Pat Lotz and uh, Jim Wohner, always got two best noses I've ever known in the industry. They were outstanding. 
And so I'd meet them, he would meet them halfway, then I would get results, their thoughts, back within you know, a few hours. So uh, we were getting better, and then Jim Wolner called me one third, about the third week of February, 95, and uh, it's a little before seven in the morning, I think, and I said, I wonder who's calling me this time of day. It's usually morning. never a good, good sign. And uh, yeah, he says, Jim, I said, what in the blankety blank blank you guys doing down there anyway? And my, I knew we were getting better. My heart just dropped. I mean, I slumped back in my chair, and I said, what are you talking about? He said, I've never seen a sample like this. This is unbelievable, like the one you sent up yesterday. He went on and on and on and on, and I said, gosh, I know we're getting better. I said, what's wrong with it? And he just, I've never seen anything like this. He went on for five or six minutes, seemed like forever. And he finally laughed. He said, I was just calling to let you know you had your first four rating in over three years. And we had a rating system, one, two, three, four. Four is typical good quality. Three were very minor deviations. Uh, two were a little more serious deviations, but with all 90% or better at the time, would make a very good uh, barrel of bourbon. One was an automatic reject. When I got there last three years, it averaged something like uh, 1.9 something, 1.96, I think it was. Oh, wow. So there was too many, so many of the bourbons that we shouldn't, we got in the, we we're in the process, you know, anything was a reject. And we had a panel of people uh, looking at it every day because no one, I, I think, has a, this full gamut of range of uh, uh, being able to detect uh, whether it be a, a, just a hint of must or an aldehyde or different characters. And uh, if one person rated it one, it was an automatic reject. Nobody mm. challenged it, mm -hmm. uh, and we wouldn't barrel it. So, Jim, you, you're the guy who got <clears throat> Four Roses back into Kentucky. You saw Four Roses through the acquisition of Kieran, you know, Kieran acquiring Four Roses, and you led... You brought bourbon, or you brought Four Roses back with with a vengeance unlike we've ever seen a brand before, and you are also a big reason why bourbon in itself. As you were growing Four Roses, you helped all of bourbon, and and in some sense, you became the face of bourbon for bourbon geeks. And so, when you left Four Roses, that was like you talk about your heart dropping a little bit. The heart drop. For a lot of bourbon geeks out there, and um, after you, you the left, heart drop, and a lot of questions too. A lot, a lot of, of questions, yeah. Is, is right after you left, there was there was there was a lot of rumors as to why you left and everything. So, and you know, I wrote a couple stories about it. I talked to you about it before, but why why did you leave something you were so passionate about? Well, a, a lot went into it. Uh, you know, first of all, as far as you know, I really sort of a private person. I, I don't talk about myself, and uh, and it's true. Uh, you always talk about Four Roses and the no, whiskey. I don't, you don't, I talk don't about like yourself. talking about myself. Yeah. And uh, now, probably uh, you might have to re-ask this question. Tell me if I get off on tangents, then I have to ask <laughs> a lot of times, "What were you talking about?" We could do that. But uh, I remember when Four Roses came back, and and we hired uh, an agency, really good. Uh, Bandy Carroll Hellage mm -hmm. uh, in downtown Louisville. There's a young lady, Lindsay Lauk, I think was her name. Le I know it was Lindsay. And she told me, Jim, we're going to make a rock star out of you. I said, no, you're not. Uh, I said, it's, nothing's about me. If you're going to talk about some the employees, but it's a bourbon, we all make together. It's nothing to do with me. And the more I uh, insisted on that and... Uh, the more it happened, what I said wasn't going to, the more it did happen. But I would always be happy to talk about Four Roses. And, and uh, you know, we talked before, people ask questions. Uh, I answer every question the best I can. Uh, uh, some people didn't, you shouldn't be talking, you know, you shouldn't be telling everybody that. Uh, Who would say that? Who would tell you not to tell people? Well, stuff? when uh, <laughs> the CEO and president of Four Roses, when uh, oh, wow. Apple Seagram uh, went out of business, I said, and the quality manager back then was from uh, Kieran. Uh, they were great people. I said, what are they, what's people going to do with it? And uh, nothing. I said, even if they, 
they don't have a distillery and they're not going to build a distillery that can, even if they did everything like we do, which is impossible. Is that something? Still not gonna be, is that something you did a lot? Like you would stand up to like the the brass of the company? No, oh, I did that back in Seagram. I've always been like that, I guess. <laughs> but uh, you know, and uh, with Karen, you know, I I had explained because you know they weren't the people uh, from Karen, and I thought the world of them. Uh, Terry Ukudino, we called him Terry. Uh, Joda Tanaka was in quality. Uh, Moto Ishihara as a CFO. Uh, really, really good people. Mm-hmm. But you know, in Japanese uh, management style, you know, you have a hierarchy. You know, the top level at, at top, and wherever you fit into this hierarchy, if the person right above you tells you to do something, you do it. You don't challenge it. And I said, well, it's my responsibility to tell you. As far as I'm concerned, if if I, don't, if I see things not going right, or you know, in the distillation process, or or uh, anything, uh, I feel it's my responsibility to tell people. And but that goes back in the Seagram years too. Uh, I, I mean, I debated uh, before I left New York. Uh, I'd started trying to do what I could. I wasn't passionate about it, but I felt like. Uh, I was doing the distillery, long-range distillery planning, as I'd mentioned, and in you know we all, our industry had been sliding from about '68 all the way through the '90s, but in '88 the Japanese market, and we were the top-selling bourbon. It was always us or I.W. Harper, and I think we were top-selling back then. We were always one or one and two, and uh, the Japanese market shot through the roof, and uh, just didn't gradually grow. Of course, we had put away bourbon you know, five, six years prior to that, based on this trend of sliding and losing volume every year. So uh, back in 88, I had, uh, you know, Seagram owned uh, Eagle Rare, uh, the Antique Series, Benchmark Bourbon, and some other bourbons. And (laughs) I was the person that uh, uh, talked to the marketing company of Seagram and said, you know, we have one global growth market. We sold these brands, I just mentioned, to other companies to devote our barrel inventories, along with those brands, with some inventory, but we were able to retain some barrels of inventory to devote to this one global growth market. So, you know, I've always uh, done things, I, I guess, that uh, I felt needed to be done. And But back then, once we got settled out and we got... Uh, uh, we end up with enough bourbon to cover the growth market and our other uh, key markets in Europe. Then I started doing what I could to get four roses. We need to bring it back. And then I became very passionate about it once I was transferred to four roses. Uh, I mean, it, the more people said no, the more it became a burning passion. Hmm. Every conversation I ever had with uh, anyone in New York, especially the marketing salespeople, uh, somehow or another, I always get back to when we're going to get Four Roses back. I said, I know what we're putting in a barrel. I know what we can put in the market. And uh, I would understand them. I said, Jim, you're one of uh, 225 Seagram brands. You're one person. Uh, we appreciate your passion and enthusiasm, but you're one person. And don't be mad at us for what our predecessors did some 40 years ago when they uh, had the bourbon and introduced the blend of whiskey, which was good blend of whiskey at first, but uh, Seagram had a history. You know, they built a brand until they felt like the brand reached the peak of performance. Then they pulled 100% of the support. Uh, and uh, when that happened with the Four Roses blend of whiskey they had introduced, uh, it became a... Uh, uh, Pretty rock cut. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean it, that's it, it, that's what it was. So the passion, and, the the passion for Four Roses is so deep with you, and it kind of go back to this, and uh, you know, to the question, the original question, w- where we both got off on tangents, both of us. <laughs> um, that connection, it's like family to you. So I guess uh, I, I'll, I'll kind of bring it back up. What what was the reason for leaving? Did you know that according to adage.com, podcasts are able to engage listeners in a way traditional media can't? Podcasts are mobile. They can be taken anywhere a listener goes. 
It also becomes part of their daily routine, such as commuting, exercising, mowing grass, or perhaps just cleaning around the house. Did you also notice that you're listening to this right now? You'll never hear about a person just flipping through podcasts, so your message is heard loud and clear. It's also a permanent endorsement because it's built into the audio playback. That's a benefit not offered by any other medium. If that sounds interesting, let's talk. Send me an email, team at bourbonpursuit.com. Now, let's get back to the show. That connection, it's like family to you. So I guess uh, I'll, I'll kind of bring it back up. What, what was the reason for leaving? Well, I, I had uh, done what I could uh, at the distillery, with the distillery, and uh, now uh, the Japanese uh, management, they rotate every three to five years. And uh, things would change. The virgins, they, they knew me, they understood me. And, but uh, then they began, some, some of them said, Jim, this is master distiller. That's just a, uh, that's just a marketing uh, position, isn't it? I said, no, not with me. It, it has become that. And even back then, and they were wanting me, rather than spend time in the distillery, always on the road with, through Europe, Japan, uh, like some of the others. And uh, it seems like that I now want, everybody can, like everybody's got their Delta Diamond card, everybody's got this. Yeah, and, yeah. I wanted to be in the distillery. And uh, so two of the partners I work with right now, uh, Stephen Camisa and John Mallory. Stephen was once legal counsel. He also worked in marketing for Buffalo Trace, uh, John Mallory's worked for uh, the large Diageo and, and uh, other groups in sales. Uh, Stephen had legal and marketing. They formed this company, Bedford & Grove, uh, to provide sales and marketing assistance to startup distilleries or smaller distilleries that didn't have the staff to uh, and the money to hire a marketing team. And uh, we hired them when we, uh, Four Roses, when we had the inventory to begin to go out of Kentucky, because when we first introduced Four Roses, it was in Kentucky only. Uh, we only had the inventory to go somewhere else. We could have gone to a, a larger market, but uh, my philosophy was back then, and uh, I, I talked to uh, uh, Dino Son, I called him Terry, uh, that you know, if we're gonna be big, whether it be uh, Texas, California, New York, we first need to be big in Kentucky. Right. And uh, so when we started branching outside of Kentucky, we hired Bedford and Grove, Stephen and John. So uh, they worked for us for five years and then their, uh, another CEO was there and he, their contract was not renewed. And uh, later on, uh, Stephen approached me once uh, with an idea of uh, our own distillery. Uh, while I was still at Four Roses, it was... Uh, a uh, one of these small distilleries, a craft distillery is based in craft is based on size. And uh, I said I, that Four Roses was the smallest of the eight major distilleries in Kentucky. And Monday through Friday, we averaged about two, filling 285 barrels a day. And I said, there's no way in the world that that I can go to a craft distillery and fill two or three barrels a day. I'd go crazy. <laughs> it's just not and, a, it's no, not enough for you. No, shoot, no. And uh, you probably but, you probably can't get honed in the quality either for you. Like you're so used to the kind of the larger scale equipment, like the little rinky dinks. It's, 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 it's huge difference. Most of them use pot stills. I, I'm not familiar with pot still distillation. Uh, I mean, it's not that it's uh, it's not rocket science. It's something you could get used to, but it just wouldn't uh, be fun to me. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I didn't really consider it. And, uh, but we got to the point where uh, I was being asked to do more marketing and, and traveling all the time. Getting on and podcasts I loved and shit. To, yeah. and, well, I love doing that. And I, I love going out. And I love talking about Four Roses and the bourbon industry. I love the industry. And I enjoy doing it. I didn't like to travel. I always, you know, I wanted to be on Star Trek and zap me there. But uh, amen to that. Yeah, and uh, but at my age, uh, 
they wanted me doing that and bringing up young people in the silver. I understand that part of it. And, uh, but they did felt you, like, uh, did you hire Brent Elliott? Uh, no, I was not, uh, okay. but I, I was part of the interview and, yeah. and I really thought a lot of Brent. And, uh, when I left, I pushed hard because, uh, I was the only one that recommended, uh, Brent to start with. And I pushed and pushed and pushed again. And, uh, cause Brent is, he's a super person. He, he does a great job. And, uh, wow. So you, you within the four roses, you were the only one really pushing for him to start with. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was about. To, I mean, that was actually the next question I was going to ask was how your relationship was with him because oh, he, he, was, is great. he wasn't because you were as, as Fred had mentioned the face like you were the yeah. face of Four Roses and then all of a sudden, um, you know, you're on your way out. Brent's in, and it was funny because you came here, uh, you went to my bar, and you actually grabbed Brent's face bottle and <laughs> actually poured that because you had actually never had it before. And so I was, I was actually curious, like how that relationship was oh it's was fantastic uh, uh we don't talk very often but occasionally we have an, uh, a reason to have a conversation but uh he was the right choice and uh he could you know everybody wants to do their own thing so uh but he could call me uh right today and i would give i would answer every question if he had questions you know this is a big if it, it's not going to happen but if he did I would be right there with him to, to help him with anything. I think a, I think a lot of people really respect him and really uh, think he does a good job, and it's good to know that you all have oh, that I, kind of relationship. Yeah, I, I think the world of Brent. So after after you leave, it, uh, it, it, it you you start make the announcement at some point that you're going to take the entrepreneurial leap, and you you went about it with in a different fashion that I think that a lot of people would have expected you to, and you did a Kickstarter campaign. What, what was that about? Well, you know, with, well, it might work. And uh, now over the past two years, uh, a couple of years or since I've retired, it's been three years now, uh, but we learned pretty quick. You know, it took a while to get in. We visited some craft distillers, and, and I said, if I'm going to be involved in it, uh, we've got to do something more than a hobby. Which a craft distillery? I, I looked at it in, in that respect. I said, "We've got to, uh, we're going to have to uh, go mid-sized distillery, and uh, you know, become a larger distillery to make money mm-hmm. and, and do a good job where we can have a distillery, as you mentioned earlier, uh, we can run twenty-four-seven operation, which you get more consistency yeah. that way. Uh, if we went with a thirty-six inch." Still, which we, I said, that's a minimum I want to go with. Uh, we producing 35, 36,000 barrels a year, depending on uh, how long we ran in the summer. We go 42, or we go up to 48 inch, and be up to 62, 63, like four roses. And we, so we built our financial plans and all on a 36 inch. It sounds still. like the more and more you talked, he was just like, this Excel spreadsheet's getting bigger and bigger. Oh, it is. <laughs> well, I, they, and then uh, we're very, very, I think, conservative on our long range estimate sales, starting off slow because, uh, for one reason, uh, I said, if we're going to have surprises down the road, I want them to be favorable, not negative. And I want to be surprised with the volume we will have, and not disappointed with what we, you know, we we overshot what we thought we could do. So we've been very conservative uh, in our planning, but we have learned through the uh, last few years that we don't, you know, myself. I've been in the business when I retired forty about forty nine years. Uh, right now, I haven't gotten out of the business, so. Uh, uh, it's 52 years this November. Uh, Stephen has 36, 37 years, or maybe 38 now. Uh, John Mowry, uh, mid-30s. And then we brought on Will Conniff, who had spent uh, 36 or 7 years building. Uh, he was a key executive with uh, Southern Wine and Spirits, building it from a small distributor, the world's yeah. largest distributor. So we've covered every so many different areas of Distillery management, other than finance, we'd have to hire. A I know, CFO. like like the the team you've uh, assembled, 
It's is, a dream team. <laughs> it, it's really a, it really is. It's a dream team from a trade perspective. Like yeah. a lot of consumers won't recognize the faces or anything, but I know these people, Kenny, and they're like they're the people who <clears throat> got bottles and shelves and liquor stores and made sure deals happen. So it really is uh, a, an incredible team. Now, in terms of like the the distillation side. Do you have a do you have a crew that you're planning to recruit uh, or anything like that? No, no, no one uh, in particular. I mean, uh, so how does one how does one start? Because uh, Kenny's been thinking about getting in distillation for a while now. Yeah, and, uh, it's in the it's in the back room. He yeah. wa- he wants to find out how to be the assistant master distiller. But how does one go about becoming your number two? Now, uh, I like honestly what. Uh, uh, Cass and Key has done. Uh, I've talked to uh, Kave at Rabbit Hole and, and told him, you know, there's a master distiller, and, and I've told our guys, uh, master distiller is used too much as a, just a marketing uh, mm-hmm. term now. And you call me distiller, senior distiller, whatever, mm-hmm. just don't, don't bother calling me master distiller. Oh, really? You don't want to be called master distiller uh, anymore? Uh, it doesn't make any difference, but it doesn't have the meaning it did when. Uh, the first of us that went in. Uh, so it really pisses you off when you see people who have not been. D- no, I, t- I, I can't say, but it's uh, most distilleries uh, that start up, uh, you know, they uh, announce plans to start up in a year or two. And, and uh, I'm starting my own distillery. I've never been in the business, but I say, I think I'll be the master distiller. It's become a job title, mm-hmm. not an earned. Uh, it's like something that's in the, the corporate org chart. You, you, you got to fill this position. Yeah. Right? Somebody's yeah. got to take the CEO. Might as well be me. But, uh, uh, you know, and I told Kave, uh, he was just in the pl- starting rabbit hole. You know, it's really a team effort and getting good employees. Uh, and a lot of people ask me, and, and uh, my own partner, Steven, he says, we've got to have one or two backups. I said, you know, we hire people. And I would rather hire somebody uh, rather than a lot of experience. I'd rather hire somebody with a great attitude and passion. And you can teach the process. This is not rocket science. So you've mm. got to teach them to want to b- produce the very best distillates. There. You know, you may never achieve it, but you never stop trying. And once you get to wherever you are, you think it's really good, you can be better the next day. And I want people like that. And then... Uh, we would choose. We so we fill the positions. We we want to get to a uh, position where we run 24/7 as quick as possible, and I think I think we will because we already have people approaching us. Uh, even right now, it's a couple years out before we have a distillery about a, a contract uh, distilling. You know, we've had people approach us with a few hundred to up to 20,000 barrels mm-hmm. already. So we may end up going to 48 inch still. But so we get, well, hold on now. We, you wait, don't, wait, even, wait, you don't wait, even have your still up, and you're yeah. already trying to contract you. No, people have, you know that. That's why I'm, we start out with 36. That's why we're thinking we might have to go to 48 because people are already contacting us. There you have it, folks. You know, yeah. already expanding. <laughs> that's <laughs> <It's> right. Awesome. <laughs> but uh, but we also have an advantage with this dream team that we've put together. Uh, we have people, John Mowry, and he's. He, He's out in California, and uh, that gives said, him like a couple extra points when you live in California. You know, you got a coolness to mm-hmm. you. <laughs> but uh, you know, he says you know, he's being asked all the time. When, when we go to see, uh, and I've been asked, and so Stephen uh, and Will, people are asking us, when are we going to see uh, a Rutledge bourbon arrive? We even if we started at Silver, it'd be quite a while before we see Rutledge. We, we'd have other brands out first because uh, we wouldn't put my name on something until I had more age and uh, uh, and then how much age I don't know because I'm not as Fred as you know I'm not a big fan of the older the better is 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 not true but you got to catch those barrels at the right time so mm-hmm. it would be several years before we'd have uh, a Rutledge bourbon arrive but we own uh, uh, a couple trademarks and uh, we'll put other brands out. Uh, we'll have one out this year. So it sounds it's, like the wheels are turning. So what's, yeah. what's been the biggest... Hold on. Hey, wait. He said he said you're going to have one this year. What What is that? Uh, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but oh. you're not going to... Uh, <laughs> well, but, you don't have to. But, I mean, go yeah, ahead. Uh, <laughs> well, 
I we own the trademark rights to. Uh, it's an old brand you may may or may not remember. Cream of Kentucky. Oh yeah, oh, wow. Cream, yeah. You don't remember because yeah. you're too young. Oh well, yeah, but, see, uh, I see the old bottles all the time, and people. Yeah, go Cream of Kentucky. Um, if, they used you know, to have these ads of uh, people uh, eating chicken and stuff, and they would say, "This is the Cream of Kentucky," and it was like they had like an kind of a Colonel Sanders approach to their marketing. Well, and Norman like, Rockwell so. did most of that Norm, artwork. That's right. Norman Rockwell was really and, uh, connected. But to we it. have that and. Uh, Stevens for the uh, last couple of years, we need to get a brand in the market. That would help so much if we had a brand in market. I said, yeah, it would. But, you know, from my perspective, you, know, you, you can work a lifetime building a reputation, and but you can lose it in a heartbeat if you put something that's just take anything and put it in a, in a bottle. I said, and I wouldn't approve anything. So we finally found some bourbon that uh, uh, actually – ask you to make sure that uh, I was thinking right. I hope those weren't super selected samples. But, uh, you know, that was an honor for me, too, by the way. <clears throat> oh, I appreciated your help and uh, respect uh, what you do more than you know. And uh, so that meant a lot to, to get okay because I hadn't approved it yet until, uh, uh, until I got your, your opinion on it, too. But we will have that uh, somehow by the end of the year. Uh, we'll have uh, enough for about three different rounds of introduction. Uh, we'll have the first time. These are six bottle cases, about 1,500 cases. Then uh, several months later, we'll do another 1,500. And then uh, we'll do about 1,000 more, something like that. Uh, That's awesome. Is, is uh, it going to be Kentucky only? Uh, no, we're going to do okay. several states. All right. Because we need to be in uh, – uh, this is – you know. This is not me. John Mowry and especially John, we respect his opinion. And we've got this team together and Will Conniff. So we, they've selected several markets, and I can't tell you because I'm not sure which, which ones. Uh, I know California would be one of them. I think Texas uh, maybe one. Uh, obviously Kentucky. And I'm not sure what are, what are the markets uh, they will do it. But I leave it to those people who know that end of the business. And uh, – and uh, go along and, and trust in them. That's real cool. I think uh, that's probably, we'll, we'll ask, I'll kind of ask one more question as we uh, want to wrap this up here, but this is going to go on another of the, uh, the speculation ideas of, you know, since you've been so ingrained in this industry for so long, where do you see the American whiskey category trending here in the next five years, 10 years as are the big boys going to keep getting bigger? Do craft distilleries stand a chance? What, what's your? Where do you see the trends going? You know, these are opinions and guesses, I guess. But uh, hey, you're a very qualified dancer. Uh, you were the long range planner for Four Roses well, and Seagrams. As far as the industry, this you can ask me about the distilleries later if I get if I forget again. We'll talk about the industry. My instant recall. Keep it brown. Get, <laughs> but. Um, you know, you go back to 1968, I think, uh, our barrel inventory in Kentucky uh, was about 8.8 .8 or 8.9 million, approaching 8.9. And, uh, you know, it started sliding. Now, I just, we just saw recently, a week 7. or two ago, 7.5 million barrels. Back then, about 10% of those barrels were designated for export. Now it's around 40%. So we haven't got back up to where we were back then. And the international markets, I mean, if it ever truly, uh, if China were to open up, we couldn't produce enough bourbon. Uh, but if, you know, if it doesn't, uh, India's uh, another big growth market. Uh, you know, it's, it's become people globally have begun to realize, hey, there's another whiskey in this world besides scotch and it's bourbon, and in particular, Kentucky bourbon. Kentucky means a lot. And, uh, but it's bourbon whiskey. It's, it's growing globally. So, but we haven't come back up to where we were perhaps uh, way back when uh, because so many of the barrels are designated for export. I think, uh, you know, everybody wonders. You know, for all the years I was doing the long-range distillery planning for uh, uh, Sigram distilleries, you know, it was always, the only time we were ever, and it will stay that way. The inventory is ever in balance with, uh, uh, barrel inventory in balance with the case sales is when the 
market's going up and down. It's it's like a yo-yo. But uh, now it's going to, you know, there, there'll be dips, and but mostly it's just continually going to grow for, I think, years and years and years to come. It's uh, healthier than it's ever been during my entire career, and it's got a long, long, long way to go before you'll ever see uh, dips. Even, uh, you know, uh, economics have never really had a negative impact, you know, dep whether it's a depression, recession, has never really had uh, that big a negative impact in our industry. And uh, I, I just, I wish I was younger and had a, a lot longer to go than I do. But because it's, it's uh, the growth is just going to be phenomenal for years. I can remember going back to the early 80s and I was always a bourbon fan and, and I can't remember exactly where I was in a meeting, but somebody was had a big, uh, Screen, uh, screen on uh, a PowerPoint, I guess, uh, presentation, and they had the whiskeys of the world, a pie graph, and bourbon was something like six, seven, little less than seven percent, perhaps. Scotch, and they were saying, "Look at Scotch, thirty-seven point seven percent, or whatever it was. It was about that." And everybody said, "You know, you just can't compete with with uh, with the Scotch market." And my philosophy, well, I said. Look how far we have to go. Look at all the growth potential. And, uh, and it's there. And we've reached that. And we're going to go for a long, long time. Well, I appreciate you with those sentiments. And I think it's, it's very easy to say that, you know, you'd, you'd kind of hinted at, you know, you want to be around to be able to see this. But I think your name's going to be etched in those history books no matter what uh, when this comes to comes Well, they are because I wrote them. Yeah, very good. <laughs> <laughs> He's all in them. <laughs> Well, Jim, I want to say thank you very much again for coming on the show today, giving us, uh, you know, the opportunity again to kind of capture a lot of these experiences and what you're doing now. And I think we're both, and I think a lot of the listeners too, are looking forward to seeing what's next to come from you. Well, I'm, I'm really, really excited. I'm, I can't remember when I've been this excited. Well, make sure you have uh, put some room in there for old Ascot barrels because we're going to yeah, need some of those. Yeah. Hey, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <That's kind of laughs> brand. So again, thank you for coming on the show today, Jim. Oh, it's my um, pleasure. If I, anybody wants to read more about uh, what website would they go and, and figure out more information about what's going on? They got to apply for those jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Whether well, we have a, uh, and we haven't updated it in a long time, our, our website, and we did it ourselves. We didn't have any money. I mean, it's something we put together, Stephen and I. Stephen did, Camisa did uh, just about all the work on that. Uh, J.W. Rutledge Distillery, uh, LC.com. Awesome. And, uh, but the word will get out. Well, good deal. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit as well as Fred Minnick on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And who knows, maybe we'll get a, uh, a front page story with uh, Jim and an episode of, oh, or a copy of Bourbon but, Plus at yeah. some Before point. Before I too. start following you on this stuff, you guys keep. Teach me how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so make sure you go get your copy of Bourbon Plus. Subscribe there as well as subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. If you do like the show, support us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. And if you have any email suggestions, want to get in touch with us for any odd reason, send us an email, team at bourbonpursuit.com. Fellas, thanks again for joining today, and we will see everybody next week. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.